This session is going to be a, a discussion about upgrading web parts. My name is Maurice Prather. A little bit of information about myself. Uh, I think the, the number one thing to call out here is that if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Um, I've been working with SharePoint for over 10 years now. I uh, originally started working with SharePoint uh, long before our keynote speaker actually started working on the product team. I was also there. Uh, and in particular, my team was responsible for the creation of um, the rendering engine for SharePoint. So everything that we see today in terms of safe controls lists, uh, code access security, web parts themselves, my team was responsible for creating and generating. And so I have uh, uh, you know, been in the nuts and bolts of uh, the product for a good many years. Uh, nowadays, I work as a consultant, and I do a lot of uh, events such as this. So I, I hope what we'll be able to get out of this is a, a, a really good insight into what, what the uh, framework gives us and what we will be able to uh, expect out of web parts as we move them from uh, platform to platform. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what we're going to cover today is we're going to uh, we're going to look at the evolution of uh, web parts. We're going to quickly look at uh, the sandbox and what it means to migrate into the sandbox. We're going to look at uh, a couple of things that uh, have been added to the framework itself. In particular, we're going to take a look at something known as safe against script. We're going to uh, then look at uh, a couple of things that are probably being phased out uh, that are related to the web part framework itself. And then finally, we're going to close out our conversation with assembly versioning. Assembly versioning is a very interesting topic, especially if you're a, a traditional uh, .NET developer and you're looking at web parts. You probably have really good questions there in that space. And so it's something that we, we definitely want to look at. <clears throat> so as we uh, start off with uh, talking about SharePoint, I, I want to remind everyone that uh, Inevitably, we always have an answer or a phrase, if you would. Whenever someone asks you, how do I do something in SharePoint, right? Um, I think we have to keep in mind that our answer is it always is, it depends, right? So think about it this way. If someone says, how do I put a link on a page? Well, I bet if you're experienced with SharePoint, you probably can think of at least you know, five or six different ways you can do it, right? So in that same kind of context, we're going to want to take a look at uh, the concept of upgrading web parts in, uh, along those lines, right? Like really, what does it mean and what are you trying to achieve? So before we talk, uh, dive into that, let's, let's get our terminologies uh, put out on the table so that we know uh, what we're talking about. Uh, first and foremost, a couple of things that we'll, we'll want to look at is... Uh, Something known as a WSS web part. Now, this is a, a web part that's based off the Microsoft.SharePoint.WebPartPages.WebPart uh, class. And this particular class was introduced in version 2, also known as uh, SharePoint 2003. Um, we have uh, ASP.NET web parts, and ASP.NET web parts were uh, uh, based off of a class that was uh, released by the ASP.NET team, and that would be system.web.ui.webcontrols.webparts.webpart. And that was introduced in uh, SharePoint 2003. We have definition files. Uh, our definition files are, are, are the serialized form of our web parts of any given instance. Hey, Todd. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey. Can't, can't uh, be without our phones. As we know, we're all tied to them so, so uh, closely. And so um, our definition files are really important because what we'll want to keep in mind is that they always uh, define the instance of a web part. And so as we look at uh, something such as uh, assembly versioning, that becomes very important for us to, to keep in mind what they represent. Um, we have a web part package. Uh, web part package is our legacy, legacy packaging system that we had uh, 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 for web parts that were introduced in uh, SharePoint 2003. And our web part packages are still available for use in uh, uh, 2007 and 2010. And then finally, we have solution packages which were introduced in 2007 and are obviously uh, still available for use in 2010. So 
Uh, one of the things that we want to keep in mind is that um, as we look at the concept of upgrading, right, we always, we, 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 what we need to do is to kind of step away from our keyboards a little bit and um, look at the bigger picture, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to ask, what is our starting point? And more importantly, where are we trying to go, right? Whenever we talk about upgrade, it's always very important for us to understand what we're trying to accomplish. What are we trying to leverage? How much have I already invested into uh, this particular code base? Think about how your users are going to be affected. And so if, if we really kind of simplistically look at it, there's really three types of things that we're going to be looking at over the long term life of our web parts, right? We have on the far uh, left, let's see, that would be left hand. On the far left hand side, we have our web part packages that we might have started out with in uh, 2003. We have solution packages that have been, uh, that rolled into place in 2007 and 2010. So what are the things that we want to work with? And so that really kind of helps us define what is upgrade, right? Now if we talk about upgrade, there's actually uh, several different concepts of upgrade, right? We can look at web part version to version, right? So that would be something that perhaps you, you created today and the next month you need to go out and uh, roll out a new version of your web part, either for a fix or a, or a uh, feature enhancement. Then we also have uh, upgrade from uh, a SharePoint version to version. You know, for example, uh, if you created something that was uh, initially designed for 2007 and now you're looking at uh, rolling it out for 2010. We also have different concepts of upgrade in, uh, in terms of rebasing. Are you going to be looking at uh, changing your web parts from WSS to ASP.NET web parts? Uh, if you have legacy uh, uh, web part packages, maybe you need to have those converted over to solution packages. And then finally, there's also uh, concepts of uh, dealing with the .NET framework binding and also even uh, going as far, far down into the project level of, uh, you know, what do you do with your uh, Visual Studio project itself. Now for us, what we're going to look at really is uh, just these top two elements. What we're going to concentrate on is what it takes to get our web parts from version one that we release today to version two that we may, may release tomorrow. And we'll also take a look at uh, the impact of our version-to-version. Uh, -version. You know, so uh, if we look at uh, 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 deploying our web parts out from a 2007 uh, installation out to a 2010 installation, what are the things that we're, we're going to be cognizant of? So in order to kind of look at those two aspects, let's, let's look at uh, life in three different uh, view frames. First, let's look at what's new inside of 2010 for web parts, right? So inside of 2010, we have a few different things that are available to us. We have uh, the client object model. Now, everyone, uh, I, is it a safe assumption to say everyone knows what the client object model is? Yeah, okay, so for those of you that are kind of shaking your head like I'm not entirely sure, Client object model is a JavaScript library, right? And it's a JavaScript library designed to allow us to interact with our SharePoint sites. We also have this concept of web part versioning. Uh, how many of you guys have worked with web parts in 2007? Okay, awesome. How many of you guys uh, are familiar with the problem with um, web parts on publishing pages in 2007? In the fact that, uh, you know, for example, if you've gone to uh, pretty much any WCM lecture, you probably heard, don't use web parts to insert content into your publishing pages, right? The reason was that uh, content and publishing pages in relation to utilizing a web part, none of that was versioned, right? Your, your publishing pages had a beautiful versioning uh, uh, scheme, but whenever you made a change to a web part, that was an immediate change. And so even though your page itself was being versioned, your web part, whatever settings that you apply to the web part, became immediate, and there was no way to roll back. So in SharePoint 2010, that problem has gone away for us. So effectively, we now have versioning of our web parts. Now what's really cool for us as developers is, it just happens. There's absolutely nothing that we need to do. If our page has versioning, or our pages library has versioning turned on, you're going to get web part versions. 
You go in, edit version one of a page. You have a variety of settings for a web part. Check in your changes. It becomes version two, version three, version four. You can go back and, and, and know that your changes only become effective at the time that the, the, the uh, page is published. And more importantly, you have rollback capability. So that's really, really nice. Again, as, as developers, we just have that. Uh, we don't really need to do anything there for, for, uh, to get versioning. Uh, <clears throat> another thing that's really nice uh, is that we now have Ajax. If you're uh, familiar with 2007, Ajax was kind of a difficult thing for us to work with because we had to kind of roll our own uh, uh, strategy of making sure that the component tree was on the page. Well, all of that is now there for us. Uh, in 2010, we now have a variety of cross-site scripting safeguards. So cross-site scripting becomes an interesting problem space for us. So there's a couple new things there, and we'll take a look at that. And then finally, we have Sandbox Solutions. And Sandbox Solutions is probably one of the most interesting spaces for us to kind of explore as web part developers. Now, uh, Chris Johnson at the... the uh, Keynote kind of mentioned Office 365, Office 365 being a hosted experience. Well, you know, the number one question that we could probably ask there is, can I install web parts, right? Well, think about how we deployed web parts in 2007. What kind of, what kind of uh, access did you need to a SharePoint 2007 farm to install web parts? You needed admin, right? Which basically meant you had to have rights to log into the machine as an admin and get all the way down to a console. Now, you guys looked at that fancy little chart that Chris had up there that was a bunch of squares and it was showing you the, the layers and then he had a grid manager. It was that one slide with the boxes. Nowhere in there, and Chris kind of even mentioned it a little bit, nowhere in there does it ever say our users are gonna be given a console window that allows us to get to a machine, right? So Sandbox Solutions becomes a really interesting space for us in 2010. So let's take a look at the framework and see what's changed in 2010 in terms of uh, what's available for us, right? So for web parts, what we now see in SharePoint 2010 is that we have an emphasis, a very strong emphasis in almost, and in one case, a requirement for what we call feature deployed web part files, definition files. Now, uh, since a bunch of you raised your hands and said you have experience with SharePoint 2007, how did you deploy your web part DWPs or your dot web part files? Did you utilize uh, a feature to deploy your definition files or did you utilize DWP files, which is a tag inside of your solution manifest? Features, okay. So, very interesting, right? Because that's kind of what we were taught in 2007 is to start utilizing features. Now, it's an important characteristic, right? Because we know that inside of a featured deployment of a definition file, all we're doing is publishing the DWP or our .web part file. It doesn't really control the instantiation or use of that, of that web part in 2007. Same rule applies in 2010. However, if we get over to Sandbox Solutions, that's the only way you could ever get a web part to work. So you have to utilize uh, feature deployed web parts. So that's really important for us to keep in mind. And then finally, what we see is that in 2010, we have a continued focus on uh, utilizing ASP.NET web parts. Now, the, the, in, the, the, the I don't want to say caveat, the, the point here is that we can really see that uh, the product team is moving away from the old WSS web part, right? The WSS web part was published in 2003, was available in 2007, is technically still available in 2010, but in parallel, in 2007, we had the ASP.NET web part brought out. The WSS web part is technically now based off of the ASP.NET, and generically, for us as uh, web part developers, we have to use ASP.NET web parts, especially if we want to enter this into the sandbox world. So very important to, to kind of keep in mind. 
So we've looked at what's new, we've looked at what's different, and then the question is, well, what's the same? Well, for the most part, everything else is the same. The WebPart framework has gone through an extensive revamp uh, in 2007, right? We went from a, 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 a very product-specific WebPart framework that was released. 2007, it was rebased, recreated. And actually, you know, if you want to think about in terms of uh, product development time, it took our team over a year and a half to rewire everything from what was known as a WSS web part to get to get <coughs> excuse me to getting a uh, a brand new ASP.NET web part working in SharePoint. It took us a year and a half to kind of work through all of the strategy of you know how do we take a DWP, how do we convert it over, how does it work, how does it render. So generically, a lot of that effort really came out into something that is intrinsically really nice for us because it, in, it ensures that we have a lot of backwards compatibility, right? And because we have a lot of backwards compatibility, what we can generically say is, you know what, if you have 2003 WebPart packages that you built, that will still work in 2010. And also, our 2007 solution packages will also work in 2010. So, in a sense, right, like, I, we're only 15 minutes into this conversation. In a sense, we know that our web parts, our upgrade strategy is actually pretty straightforward. What works in the past should continue to work in the future. Now, what we're going to look at is the subtle differences. There are a couple subtle differences that I think uh, will be important for us to look at. So, first, and maybe this one's not such a subtle difference, is um, the concept of migrating to the sandbox, right? How many of you guys are, are, are really familiar with the sandbox? Okay. How many are not so familiar with the sandbox? Okay, so the next couple of slides are gonna help you guys kind of figure out what the sandbox is, because inevitably, for those of you that raised your hand and said, I have 2007 experience, right? What you were working with is what we now call farm solutions, right? They're traditional solutions that require us to be admins. We have to go down to the console window. Well, we also have this concept of sandbox solutions. Now, here's a, here's a couple points about what the sandbox is. <clears throat> so, first and foremost, the sandbox is designed to protect our servers, right? Our admins are paranoid, right? In many ways, our admins don't trust us, and I don't blame them, right? If you think about how do we develop, I do this all the time. I teach admin courses. I do a lot of architecture work, but you know what? When it comes to code time, what do we do? We make ourselves admins on a box. <laughs> we're probably running as domain admins. All, you know, all security's turned off, and we're just going at it, right? Like, it's going to work, and it looks beautiful, and it looks great. Unfortunately, that strategy, that methodology, sometimes bumps us up into things that we didn't think about, right? Because it inevitably means we're probably doing something we're not supposed to be doing, or at least not what the admin wanted. So our admin pretty much said, you know, think about it this way. Our admins are coming back and going, you know what? I love your code, but I don't really want to install it because I'm not sure what it's doing. So the sandbox is really kind of designed to help us protect the servers, right, and limit the impact of our scope. Because our admins go, you know what, I've gone to those SharePoint conferences, and I see that we can write code to do anything. I can write PowerShell to do anything, right? Well, PowerShell is really nothing more than a shim into the API. And so if I have code that's calling into the API, you know, who's to say my web part's not, you know, reformatting my drives or reformatting my services, et cetera. If we can limit the scope, admins are going to be happy. So the scope of impact for sandbox solutions is SP site or below. Nothing with administration, nothing with services, nothing outside of Microsoft.SharePoint. You can't even do advanced functionality there. So then that brings us to the next thing is, well, we might have to be working with newer methodologies, right? We talked about the client object model. If you're not that familiar with it, you're going to want to become more familiar with it, right? Because it gives us an opportunity to work with our SP lists, our SP sites, our SP webs, but we're letting it execute in a client space. And then finally, you know, you may want to go look at other features that kind of help you work with the sandbox. So 
In terms of the sandbox, here's the number one thing that we want to think about as devs. The sandbox is designed to be isolated, right? It is a space where code can run. It can do whatever it needs to do, but it's going to run by itself. And so when we think about isolation, here's the number one point that we want to consider. Our sandbox code doesn't have a page object. Now think about that. We're building web parts, which are standard user control, and we don't have a page object. So does that ring any bells right off the bat for you guys, right? Probably does, because now we're saying, hey, guess what? There's no interaction with other controls on that page. So some of the things that you are accustomed to with farm solutions, such as uh, web part connections, right? Web part connections work by allowing two web parts on a page to uh, pass information back and forth. Can't do it. But then also th look at this. Since we have no page object, we have no opportunity to operate with other controls on the page, we also don't have any opportunity to change the state of the page. So it's a really interesting model right off the bat, right? Like you're a isolated little guy that's doing whatever you need to do. So let's take a look at what this this represents, or how this is represented to us in terms of, uh, of, a, of, of an operational sense, right? We've talked about the sandbox, so let's see what it actually kind of physically looks like. On this page here, in the red boxes, I have two web parts. The web part on the left is a standard uh, farm solution that contains a web part, right? So this was uh, something that required me to, to log in as an admin, go down to the console, install it, deploy it out. And then on the right-hand side, we have a sandbox web part. A sandbox solution simply says that I need to be a site collection owner. And as a site collection owner, all I need to do is go into site settings and then go into my solution gallery, upload a solution package, and say, uh, and, and activate it. And so now at that point in time, it's available for use. So here's my two web parts. Now, if I put them side by side, they look the same, right? It's a SharePoint page. So how does the user uh, request, how is it handled? So in this case, right, the user simply is going to go to the URL. We know that our administrators probably have servers set up. And in many cases, we have um, our web front ends, multiple web front ends. They're load balanced. We know that in a traditional sense, a load balancer is going to send a request to a particular machine, right? That machine, that web front end, the W3WP process is going to pick up the request and it's going to say, okay, I know that I'm a SharePoint page, right? Let me, uh, let me uh, go get the information and start rendering this page. Now notice the section in the gray. Section in the gray is everything that is our normal world, our normal farm solution, right? The section in the gray is everything that's going to run in the W3WP process. However, that little web part that is in white is picked up and a special request is sent over to the sandbox service. What's really important for us to keep in mind is the sandbox service is an alternate process. And more importantly, as this little diagram shows, our, our uh, service can actually live on a machine that is completely different than our uh, web front ends that are running W3WP. So the sandbox service is going to run the code. It's, it's held to a time limit. If the code runs within that time limit, it basically hands back a bunch of text. and says, here, please insert this text into that location on the page. W3WP wraps it up with all the other stuff that's been generated sends it back to the user, right? In a nutshell, this is what our sandbox service is all about, right? It's about isolation. You're no longer in W3WP. And because you're no longer in W3WP, W3WP we now are able to offer that, that isolation that our administrators always wanted, right? So think about it this way. Let's just say my little web part timed out or it crashed. If, it, if this was in W3WP and it crashed, it threw in an unhandled exception, what would your page look like? It'd look like junk, 
right? If it crashes in the sandbox service, sandbox service says, ah, oh, you crashed. All I wanted was text. Why don't I just send text back to SharePoint that says something happened? And so the, the, what happens is that process just returns simple text that says, hey, something bad happened, inject it here where it's supposed to be a web part, move on. So your W3, WP process is nice and, and steady. So as we look at this, here's a quick question for you guys. Do you, do you think that the, if, excuse me, I think jet lag is just getting to me. Even though I was here two days ago, it's still kind of funny how jet lag bothers you. Um, so the quick question is, can you tell if there's a difference between a farm solution package versus a sandbox solution package? Raise your hands. Do you think there's a difference? Yes or no? Those that think there's yes? Okay. Is there anyone that says no? Okay. Well, <clears throat> here's the answer. There's really no difference. The package that you create, if I gave you a USB stick and said, here's a WSP, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. The only way that you would really be able to tell the difference is if you cracked it open, ripped open the manifest, looked at the manifest, kind of fumbled through it, figured out, okay, here's stuff that is allowed in the sandbox, here's stuff that's not allowed. Bottom line is, there's really no way to do it. So one, one of the things that we're trying to push along is naming standards. Now, as you guys start thinking about what you're going to be working with in, in 2010, this is something that's at least uh, going to help you long term. Because how many times have you guys opened up code that you wrote, say, six months ago, and you go, what, what did I write this for? Or what was I thinking when I wrote this? Same kind of process, right, would happen with your WSPs, right? Where, where did I want this to go? If you put it in the name, you're going to be much happier. So now that we know a little bit about the sandbox, let me share a real world experience with you. Now, <clears throat> prior to RTM, I, I had an opportunity to kind of look at the sandbox and kind of look at the product. And I was really excited. It's like, awesome. I've, I've, as you know, I've been involved with the web part framework for many, many years. And it's like, I've got web parts that do all sorts of different things, right? And so I said, let me take what I've written in the last three years since SharePoint 2007 uh, released, and let me de just deploy it out to the sandbox. I want to see it run. Now, this is an interesting personal result. Every single web part that I wrote over a three-year time span didn't work in the sandbox. Right? I'm like, oh boy, what's the problem? The problem was you have to understand the environment. And for my web parts, they were all legitimate web parts. They didn't do anything wrong. They used the proper constructs that were available to us in 2003, 2007. But realistically, some of those constructs simply didn't make sense inside of 2010 and the sandbox. So my, my failures were the result of me utilizing something known as WP resources. I had utilized something known as W. DWP files, those are two tags that are available inside of our solution manifest. Um, I also had uh, WSS web parts, right? So Sandbox requires ASP.NET web parts. Well, guess what? Can't put WSS web parts there. And then the Sandbox, like I said, is very limited, right? You can only work with SP site and below, and you can't do a lot of things, such as impersonation. How many of you guys are familiar with run with elevated privileges? Right? Okay. Guess what? Even the most simplest web part that I had failed for the, these list of reasons. So what's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is as we look at the concept of quote unquote upgrading, right? We're going to upgrade to 2010. Just saying you're going to move over to the sandbox is not good enough. You're going to have to think about what you're trying to accomplish. So. Right off the bat, let's come up with a list of things that we can work with. If we're going to work with the sandbox, first and foremost, understand the behaviors. The sandbox is limited, but it's limited for a good reason. Something I always tell my admins is don't force a strategy. Because you know, one of the things that if, you, if we were here a year and some months ago listening to Microsoft 
tout the sandbox, right, they would say sandbox everything. The reality is our admins probably went home drinking the Kool-Aid like, awesome, we can finally turn on the sandbox and I don't have to ever hear about a developer wanting to deploy code, right? That doesn't work because there's some times where you just simply have to go back to your traditional farm solution, right? And obviously you can't say sandbox everything if you actually have to use a farm solution. Um, you want to think about your design first. I know that we as developers, a lot of times we will have an inspiration in the middle of the night. You know, we're down there until, you know, six in the morning working through the night because we had a cool idea. If you want to go into the sandbox, what I want you to do is think about it a little bit, get some night's rest, wake up at six in the morning with a plan, then write your code. Because the sandbox is definitely going to make you think about things differently, right? Um, name your solutions appropriately is a good one. And then as you start exploring the behaviors, right, you're going to find that there's a bunch of limits, right? I, sandbox is a limited scope. But there's a way to get around some things. So for example, you might go, hey, you know what? I want to work with the BCS. The BCS and SharePoint 2010 is a really cool way for me to work with external data. Guess what? My sandbox web parts can't talk to the BCS. BCS is outside the scope of the sandbox. However, BCS allows us to expose our data as an external list. An external list is an SP list. We can use the SP list. So that would be one way to kind of work within the limits, right? So those, these are really uh, interesting opportunities for us to kind of uh, uh, work with the sandbox. So now let's kind of change this around a little bit and, and let's take a look at um, a couple of things that um, are available to us that have changed inside of 2010 and, and uh, will affect the behavior of any web parts that we're bringing over into the 2010 space. So, we mentioned that the client object model is a JavaScript library, right? It allows us to do a lot of stuff. It allows us to, to uh, add, delete, modify a variety of things inside of our SharePoint sites. How many of you guys have created a web part property that uh, puts out information onto a page? All right, how many of you guys, okay. How many of you guys have utilized the content editor web part? Okay, what does the content editor web part do? Takes information that you type in, puts it straight onto the page, right? Garbage in, garbage out. Okay, if we have a JavaScript library that makes it really easy for us to delete, makes it really easy for us to change properties, and we have a web part that just says, hey, you know what, give me some garbage and I'll put that straight into your page, what's it to prevent you from putting malicious script, right? So now all of a sudden, what we see is the SharePoint team said, oh, you know what? We need the client object model, right? The client object model is exactly how the ribbon works, right? Well, we need the client object model. We need web parts. We need web part properties. We've got a problem here, right? Because now all of a sudden, We've introduced a cross-site scripting hole that's about as big as, you know, the Atlantic Ocean. So, how are we going to protect this? So, first and foremost, there's three different things that the team did. Three of the things were all, all three things were designed to reduce that hole, right? What we're going to do is we're going to look at one of those. And one of those is specifically addressed, or is, is designed to specifically address um, our web part development story. <clears throat> so, the things that we have here are two developer components. The first is an attribute, a brand new attribute that is called, requires designer permission. And this attribute, if you apply it to your properties, does exactly as the name implies. In order to edit this property, you must have the designer permission or higher in order to change that property value. And then the second piece is safe against script. Now, we're all familiar with safe controls list, I hope, by now. Safe against script is now a new attribute for that safe control entry. So let's take a look at requires designer permission. This is pretty straightforward. 
right? We have a property here. <clears throat> we have a property here, and all I want to do is simply say, you know what? I want my designers, and the idea being here is that our SharePoint designer permission is only given out to the people that actually know how to do stuff, and they're not going to do stuff maliciously, right? Designers are higher permission than contributors. So in this case, we can simply say, we want this permission, or we want this property to be gated so that only designers can edit the property, right? If you want that, all you have to do is add it and say, set it to true, and you're good. Now, safe against script is the second piece, and safe against script is found in our web.config file. Now, if we go open our web, oh, that didn't come out, it slid off to the side. Um, if we go open our web.config, and I'll show you this in a second. Um, you'll see that all of our safe control entries now have a new property called safe against script. And safe against script by default is set to fault, or is by default set to false. Now you can go and set it to true, and if you open up a standard web.config, you'll find that uh, there's a variety of controls that SharePoint declares some of them are safe against script equal to true, and some of them are set to false. Now, inside of Visual 2010, what we can do is we can go and set that property as well, and all you have to do is go into the property settings for the web part, and you'll find that there's an attribute in the property grid there for your safe control entry as well, if you want to change it. So let's take a look at how these two, uh, two cross-site scripting safeguards kind of come into play. And this is really important for us to keep in mind, because if you think about it, we're now changing how the properties are made available to our users, right? So by default, our condition is this, little red X there. The default value for safe against script is equal to no. And also by default, requires de designer permissions set to false. And, and uh, if it's not applied, it's obviously false. So by default, our contributors are not allowed to edit properties. This is a change from 2007. This is one of those, oh yeah, we had, a, pro we had a, a web part, we had a usage scenario in 2007. If we go through the upgrade process or simply deploy this out to a new SharePoint 2010 site, not gonna work. My usage scenario has now broken. And then finally, if we take a look at the requires designer permission, the requires designer permission will, can completely take contributors out of the loop. So, really interesting piece there. So our impacts are this. This affects all web parts, period. Even SharePoint's web parts went through this change, right? If you have a usage scenario that says a contributor is allowed or expected to go and set a property, well, by default, they're probably being blocked now. The safeguards, uh, the requires designer permission and the safe against script property, they're, they're put there to help you prevent malicious attacks, right? The whole concept is the content editor web part scenario create a property that accepts input, what do you do? If you, just, if you don't validate it and you just let it go straight back out to the page, garbage in, garbage out, right? Here's an interesting point. <sighs> sandbox execution doesn't help us, right? We can have web parts that work in the sandbox and they do the exact same thing as garbage in, garbage out, right? So sandbox really doesn't help us here. Then finally, this doesn't apply to personalized properties. You know, so the concept here is uh, personalized properties are properties, are property bags that I only see, uh, I being uh, a user with a unique identity, right? Well, I can go ahead and write malicious JavaScript, but if I only see it, I'm only being malicious to myself, so it's not really cross-site scripting, right? <laughs> So, all right, so let's take a look at a, a different facet of, um, of uh, uh, properties here. How many of you guys have released a web part and gone through this scenario real quick? Where your web part has a property, and let's just call it address one, right? And then tomorrow you come along, you go, ooh, you know what? Uh, address one has some data, don't really know what it is, right? Because it's been in service, but now we need address two because now we, we, want to have, we want to capture more data, or we want to capture data in a different fashion. So this is a pretty common thing, right? This is what a lot of people call, quote unquote, upgrading a web part. 
Now, this is a typical strategy that I see people play out time and time again. The first thing they do is they rip out address one, and then what's the second thing they do, guys? What do you guys do? I just saw a couple shrugs, like, I don't know, we just kind of punt, right? Believe it or not, a lot of people do that. Last, last time I kind of mentioned this, one guy raised his hand and said, oh, dude, you know, we actually pray. <laughs> He's like, man, we, we just have no idea what's going to happen when we go through this process, right? And so not, not, a, you know, not a good thing, but definitely not uncommon either. So let's take a look at this. How many of you guys have uh, WSS web parts that you care about? Couple people. Okay. So let me, let me run through this real quick. There's not a whole bunch of folks here. For WSS web parts, what happens is, think about the fact that you have a DWP file, right? You have a DWP represents your, your serialized version of a, of a web part. So that serialized version lives in the content database. And when you, re you render a page, SharePoint's gonna go along and say, okay, give me that DWP, let's hydrate it, let's create an instance of it based on these properties. And so it comes along and says, okay, Address one doesn't exist anymore. Okay, address one used to be a property because obviously I have something here called address one. Let me put that into another property called uh, um, unknown XML elements. So now unknown XML elements used to be a property that, that or it still is a property that hangs off of the WSS web part. It gets shoved in there and it persists for the life of that, of that part, okay? So it becomes your responsibility, if you have a WSS web part, to go through unknown XML elements. Typically what you would do is you would utilize the after deserialize method. Look at the unknown XML elements, see if your address one exists in there, and if it does, you can take action on what you want to do with it. And then you can take the responsibility for clearing it out. Now, for ASP.NET web parts, it's a different process. ASP.NET has this concept known as iVersioning Personalizable. And iVersioning Personalizable is an interface that's specifically designed to let you handle orphan properties. Now, what's, what's the key takeaway here is a lot of people don't know about this. So this is something that you can immediately go back to your dev teams and go, hey, you know what? We now have a hook, right? So our hook is nice because basically what we do is we have an opportunity to work with the data in the load method. Right? Key point here is, unlike WSS web parts where the data was pushed into another property and that property always was persisted, ASP.NET says, you know what? We're gonna give it to you one time and one time only. Use it or lose it. If you don't save it and that web part's updated, goodbye. We're not gonna, we're not gonna carry that baggage around. So it becomes really important for you guys to kind of take a look at this. So let me jump over to my machine real quick, and we're going to take a look at a very simple web part. On this page, I have a web part that um, contains one property. All right, let me just come in to edit. And this one property, let's see, is that large enough for you guys? Probably blow it up just a bit. This one property right, has a value, and I'm just kind of following the garbage in, garbage out methodology. I, I've set it to some value. Code-wise, here is my code. Uh, let's see if I can get this to blow up a little bit. What we'll see is that my code is pretty straightforward. It simply has a property. It's described as personalizable for a shared web part. It's called original value and I simply take the, the information, I pump it out. Now, how do I upgrade this, right? So the way I would upgrade it is I have this code, it's just kind of broken out with some if statements real quick. And we see that version one uh, was available to us. It simply uh, went in, pushed it out. If we go into version two, let me change this code around just a little bit. What I would do is I would then take this web part I would implement my iVersioning personalizable interface. 
Once I do that, I can effectively go ahead and deal with uh, my property. So in this version, I got rid of my original, my original uh, um, string property. I added a new one. I'm going to call my new property evolved value, right? Uh, I now have an opportunity to work as part of the interface. I now have an opportunity to work with the load method. Inside of the load method, let me scroll that up a little bit so you guys can see it. Inside of the load method, what ASP.NET does is it gives me a collection of uh, unknown properties, some properties it doesn't know who to associate with. I simply save, save an instance of that, and then later on in time, in particular the init handler, what I do is I quickly come in here, check to see if, that, if I have a, a collection that I can work with, and all I'm gonna do is walk that uh, collection find the value that I was expecting to work with, change the value, and then set, you know, basically save it off to the new property. Okay? I'm, gonna, I'm not recording. I am not recording. So I'm going to go ahead, save this, and then recompile and redeploy. So while the system's redeploying that, I simply want to take a step back to the safe against script, just to kind of quickly highlight our web.config, gonna let the system warm back up. And just as we go look at the safe controls list, we can clearly see that in our safe controls list, go up, we can see that all of our safe controls entries now have a safe against script property. So some of them are set to true, some of them are set to false. The idea there is that you as web part developers will determine what is safe and what is not safe, right? And if they are set to safe against script is equal to true, then that obviously enables your contributors an opportunity to edit. So let's go back and look at this web part. Uh, the page should be refreshed. If we come back, what's gonna happen is the, the, uh, the web part was deployed out. I'm now refreshing the page. SharePoint's coming along going, oh, okay, here's, here's uh, your web part definition file. It's gonna fire uh, the load code. Let me get rid of this, whoops, wrong one. My mouse is a little, little wonky. It's gonna come back, fire the load code, and finally in the knit handler, like I said, all I'm gonna do is take the old value and save it to the new, new property and what we should see, whoops, if we come back to this page here, is that my web part, the way I wrote my code there, simply shows me my original value, right, which was Monday, and then the second line simply says the new value is something called updated. Just to kind of quickly show you that if we go back into edit properties, right, We'll come back here under miscellaneous. Notice my original property is no longer there. I now see my new property. With my new property, I also have my updated string, right? I took the old property string, prepended the word updated. I now saved it off to my new property. So a very straightforward way, right? So now we can get rid of the whole prey methodology. We can get rid of the we don't know what's gonna happen, let's wait for support calls to fill in. This becomes a really effective way for you to kind of go through the, the, the versions of properties, if you would, to take it from one to the next to the next. <clears throat> okay. All right, a couple of notes here with uh, DWP and uh, WP resources. Uh, for those guys that raised their hand for uh, .webpart files, this is something that was introduced in 2003. This was part of the original WebPart framework. Uh, we have a, a set of legacy file artifacts known as WP resources and DWP files. Looking at uh, where we're going with the sandbox, right? We said the sandbox is a very limited scope. Most importantly, sandbox doesn't allow us to deploy anything out to the file system. Well, these are two artifacts that are deployed to the file system. 
it's pretty safe to say that if you have legacy parts that utilize these things, um, you probably want to stop. You want to figure out how to replace them with the newer methodologies. The newer methodologies would be we're deploying stuff out to uh, the resource library or perhaps uh, uh, different locations inside of our site collections. All right? So definitely worth uh, considering. All right, so let's, let's uh, kind of circle back a little bit to a more traditional problem here. Um, how many of you guys are familiar with assembly redirection? And that's for binding information, right? Okay. So binding redirection is this interesting concept where you can take an assembly and say, okay, I want assembly version one. Any references to that, please point it to assembly version two, right? And we, we can see that assembly uh, binding redirection is at work inside of SharePoint. So if you open up your web.config, you'll find that there's a bunch of assembly binding information at the bottom of your web.config file. Now, what's really cool about binding redirect for web parts is it's always been there. You've always had a chance to work with binding redirection for web parts. However, it was really hard for you to implement, right? Why? Because A, number one, the framework didn't give you an opportunity to do it. You actually had to know how to do it. So either that meant you had a, a, a manual list of steps that you, know, you handed over to an admin that said, open web.config, copy, paste this text in this web.config file, or perhaps you might have worked with the SP web modification class, which um, is terribly buggy and can actually destroy web.config files. And so, you know, if you went through that headache, right, it was a bit of a risk there. The net result was everyone stayed at version 1.0, right? I shipped my web part today. I'm not going to change the assembly version, okay? Now, as at traditional uh, .NET developers, we love the concept of utilizing .NET functionality, one of it is assembling, assembly binding redirection, right? SharePoint 2010 now gives us an opportunity to easily pipe, uh, to pipe in that information into our web.config files. It's pretty straightforward. All we have to do is go into package designer, open up the manifest, we can add our own code, and voila. The appropriate tags are put into our web.config files. Now, as soon as we say that, there's a pretty interesting problem here. There's a bug that shipped in RTM code. It was, it was recognized literally days before RTM. I don't know if it's been fixed, don't really care, right? But the problem is, if we look at our uh, uh, public key token, right, it's basically a binary representation of eight values. And so, for example, let's take a look at this one where we have 36, 0, E2, 63, right? If we, that would be our public key token. Notice the zero one, zero one, any value less than 15 should be zero padded. That would be our public key token. Our binding redirect, this fancy little mechanism right here, unfortunately has a traditional zero padding problem. It spits out the wrong value. So it puts the wrong value into your web.config and now your web.config's got stuff that doesn't work for you. <sighs> so that's a problem, right? Because the flip side is, on retraction of your solution, it looks for the right value with the zero, doesn't find the value with the zero, and now you have this long trail of junk. Okay, so let's take a look at binding redirect and really kind of look at what the true problem area of binding redirect is, right? We looked at this page here, right? We had this page here with two web parts. We know that all our pages live inside of the contents database, right? Our web parts live inside of the content database. And our web parts are represented by two tables. So whenever you do a request for a page, you're actually, and this is a very simplistic way of looking at it, you're actually doing a join across three different tables. Now, take a look at my web parts tables and the personalization tables. Notice that very first column says GUID type one. So what happens is, when you add a web part to a, a SharePoint farm, SharePoint goes through that safe controls list when, the, when it's initializing, it says, okay, I need to go find all the stuff inside of that safe controls list. When I do, I know what's safe and what's not, and I'm gonna calculate this thing known as a GUID type, okay? GUID type's nothing that we can control other than by what we name our web parts. So from a very simplistic standpoint, this is an informational piece, right? 
The GUID type represents something that allows SharePoint to quickly find the type of web part that it's working with because when it initialized that safe controls list, guess what it did? It saved an instance of every type. Now you've loaded every type into memory. So that way when a request comes in, it's basically an optimization technique. Request comes in and says, oh, go with type one. Oh yeah, it's in my cache file. Okay, I know what the type is, I know how to initialize it, how to serialize, deserialize the information. Okay, so take a note. We have two tables, web parts and personalization. Web parts represents our shared web parts. Personalization represents our shared web, our personalization represents the parts that are are uniquely stamped to your identity, right? So the question then becomes, should you use binding redirect? Let's think about what is required to make binding redirect work 100% for me, no matter what. First and foremost, we have to keep our V1 safe controls, right? The whole concept of binding redirection is we have V1, V2, V3, V4, right? So every time I redirect, I have to keep all of my previous versions in my safe controls list. So that way SharePoint knows what it's supposed to be finding. Secondly, your parts. Technically, what happens here is, look at this GUID type. This GUID type is a calculated value that actually contains, or actually, uh, I shouldn't say it contains, it's actually dependent upon your version number. So your web part version one is gonna have GUID type one, your web part version two is gonna be GUID type two. So what happens is, SharePoint comes along and says, oh, you know what? I now have two entries in my safe controls list for version one, version two. I know how to calculate the GUID types. I'm gonna go find the GUID types in the database and I'm gonna render them, okay? But then it's gonna go, oh, wait a minute, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. GUID type one has been techni technically been, <coughs> excuse me, GUID type one has technically been redirected to a GUID type two. So what I need to do is I need to update the database and all reference, that reference for GUID type one is now changed to a reference for GUID type two. So think about it. On first render, there's actually a database write. That's not a big issue if it weren't for the fact that we have personalized properties. Personalized properties can only be rendered by who? the actual users themselves. So that makes for a very interesting space, right? Because SharePoint has to have the safe controls entry to know what GUID type to find. Secondly, we now know we have shared GUID types and we have personalized GUID types. So here's our impacts, right? To kind of help us answer that question. A number one, we know that we have additional clutter in the web.config, right? We now have safe control entries for version one, version two. <clears throat> we know that SharePoint preloads all of that type information, right? We just said they go through the safe controls list, they blow it up, it's cached in memory. It's an optimization technique. Well, if you have more entries, it becomes a traditional lookup problem, right? The bigger your cache is, the slower your, your uh, page processing is going to be. Third most important thing is there's no way to upgrade a personal part. There's, you know, a lot of times people go, well, no problem. We know every page that we want to deal with, and we know we can write code to, to, to crawl that page. Absolutely true for shared properties. You can't do it for personal properties because you need the credentials of the personal user in order to get to those personal properties. And then finally, the last thing to consider is binding redirection. If we go look at that little clunk of uh, XML, that was just putting it into the W3 WP process information. What about OWS timer? What about other things that may be referencing your web parts? So you've only partially solved the problem. So here's the general recommendation. Binding redirection for web parts doesn't make sense. It's a little too complicated. It's a little too complicated for you to 100% say, we know that we A, upgraded every web part, including shared and personal, and secondly, it doesn't make sense because we have alternate processes out there. I still have to go take care of my um, other, other guys there, right? So I still have to figure out how to get that information into uh, 
binding, uh, the, the binding redirection into the, the, the web configs, or deploy a policy file. Right? So for web parts in general, binding redirect doesn't make sense. Leave the assembly version as whatever you, you pushed it out as. Now, quick question for you guys. Do you think that SharePoint utilizes binding redirection for its own web parts? Yes or no? Come on, show me that you're awake. Okay, we heard some yeses. Are any noes? Okay, I had one person raise his hand and say no. Okay, here's the answer. SharePoint doesn't use binding redirection for its web parts at all. Why? Because it's difficult, right? Because we have shared web parts, we have personal web parts. Personal web parts can only be rendered by the, the user, right? So what SharePoint does is, at upgrade time, guess what? SharePoint knows how to calculate those web part GUID types, right? Well, when you upgrade your, your databases, SharePoint's got a huge list of web part IDs from version today, and it upgrades or changes those to version tomorrow, right? So SharePoint doesn't do that at all. Binding redirection's not in SharePoint's game for web parts. So this always just kind of brings me up to a point that uh, uh, my family has always kind of, my dad's always told me, just because you can doesn't mean you should. It's an interesting concept piece, but honestly, binding redirection for web parts just doesn't work. So let's wrap this up. A couple, couple things that we're gonna walk away with. Number one, we're gonna, we're gonna build ASP.NET web parts. There's no reason for you to utilize WSS web parts. They've, they're, they're deprecated, they're going away, there's nothing inside of that framework that you should be utilizing. You're gonna wanna take a look at your cross-site scripting safeguards, right? We have requires designer permission attribute, we have the safe against script attribute. <clears throat> Use iVersioning personalizable. It's a hidden secret, really. Most devs in this world don't know about it. I've been out preaching it for a long time now. Utilize it. Don't use the, uh, let's just roll it out and see what happens with support, right? <laughs> so use that. And then finally, binding redirection for web parts just doesn't make sense. It's too, it's too cumbersome, it's too clunky. If you roll out of assembly version one, keep it as one. If you need to have some way of tracking a version number, you can embed that information in a variety of different ways, such as file version, or perhaps even with other, inf other properties inside of, of the property bag there. But don't go and change the assembly version, simply because you don't have a good way of, of keeping track of when it's absolutely okay to rip out my old B1 safe control entry. So, that's, uh, that's what we have. A couple references here that you'll find inside of uh, the deck when, when you guys download that. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I know we're probably right at time, uh, and I don't want to keep you from lunch, but uh, if you have any questions, I'll, I'm more than happy to take them. If not uh, now, I will definitely be around for the next three days, so please feel free. And you can always send me email. <laughs>